Thank you everybody for coming today. Um, today's conference, as you all see, is about open dialogue and uh, we'll introduce you a little bit to open dialogue and, uh, uh, and talk uh, uh, in general about what experience people have had in learning and also receiving open dialogue uh, for the first time in the UK uh, in the NHS. Uh, and as you can see by the number of people here today, there's been a groundswell of interest in it uh, since we started uh, talking about it and, and trying to make the change come about uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, and somebody said in a, in a workshop I gave recently, kind of epitomized it, that open dialogue really is about, uh, is really where co-production really means co-production. So we talk about things like co-production and recovery, and it, I guess there's a lot more meaning to it when we, when we work this way, and you'll be learning about that through the course of the day. We have people who've come here from across the UK, from as, as far south as Somerset and as far north as the Highlands of Scotland. We also have people who've come uh, internationally um, from around the world. And uh, last year our furthest uh, guest came from Canada, and this year our furthest guests are here from Australia. So, welcome to our Antipodean friends. Um, next year we're hoping we'll have people from the moon, perhaps, this week. And the year after that, maybe Mars. Um, you'll be hearing from, uh, as I say, families who have received Open Dialogue, which was a major part of what we wanted to do today, as well as uh, staff training in it and, and who are also providing it. Um, and we have a very packed agenda, and the reason for a packed agenda is because a number of the people, the families and networks we've been working with, have asked us to be able to come on stage and talk about their experience. And because we wanted to say yes to as many of them as possible, we've ended up having quite a crowded agenda, uh, but you'll be hearing from, uh, from many voices today. But we, will, we do ask for your help uh, to make this run smoothly, uh, because we do need to try and run to time to make sure everybody has space. So when we have our break times, for example, 20 minutes really will have to be in 20 minutes. Uh, so we'll have to rush back here, I'm afraid. Um, the other thing is that uh, we've just worked out how to get onto the Wi-Fi system. So uh, you go to the login page and you type those four ones, 1.1.1.1. I have no idea why. But, um, that's the event code if you need it. And what we ask is that if you are going on social media, please do. We have a Twitter wall where all your tweets will be going up. Um, uh, take photos, post stuff, um, tweet, uh, and whatever else you call it. Um, and, um, but when you do, try and use this hashtag, hashtag pod4nhs. So if you do that, then uh, uh, apparently it all connects up and uh, everybody becomes one or something. But, uh, I'll, I'll, put that, I'll put that hashtag before you, you do the tweet. Okay, so by way of introducing our, our, uh, our next speaker, the person who's going to open formally today, um, I guess a lot of this started when uh, my own trust decided to create new structures called communities of practice. And what that involved is uh, uh, parts of the system that looks above the kind of operational melee and thinks about the future, thinks strategically about where our services are in the future. And we have three communities of practice. We have a children and young persons one. We have an adult one. We also have an uh, elderly and frail services one. And we each got told to sort of go away and think strategically uh, and, and, and use some vision. And the first thing that, as, as once I was asked to be lead of the adult mental health community of practice, the first thing that came up was, was open dialogue. Uh, uh, is almost certainly the way of the future for mental health services. I brought that back to the trust board and they were enormously receptive, supporting us in developing the first ever training in the NHS and supporting us uh, in organising and coordinating a, a large national transformation project. The board has been, uh, of NELP, have been uh, uh, instrumental to all of this happening and key within that has been our own chief exec and I started talking to John about Open Dialogue a couple of years ago and, and he was instantly, uh, he instantly understood it, uh, it, it chimed with him immediately, the values made complete sense uh, and so he's been a stalwart supporter through this whole process, not just within our own organisation but outside it too because we've had lots of people who wanted to know about it from the outside and he's also been uh, uh, involved in helping us spread the word. So it's with great pleasure that I welcome uh, the formal opener of our conference today, Chief Executive of Nelson, John Browder. Thank you, Russell. Good morning. You awake? A very, very warm welcome from Nelf to all of you. Uh, I am delighted to welcome you all to this very important event. It's something that uh, we are really enthusiastic about, put a lot of energy and thought into, and I know all of you do as well. Just a point. Uh, Russell did my notes. Okay. 
So, you know, if, if it all goes to pop, it's his fault, not mine. Uh, someone said to me earlier, God, I'm terrified, because she's coming up to say something. I said, it's okay, we all are. Um, she said, but you do this all the time. Yeah, I do, but it doesn't make any difference if you do it all the time. It's always terrifying. It's quite intimidating to look at, at all of you. So bear that in mind. If you want to speak out later, don't let anxiety hold you back. Speak out. That's why we are here. So a couple of things I want to talk about. First, about what we are doing, about my kind of sense of pride and where that comes from. Now, of course, the first trust to invest heavily in open dialogue. But there's a reason for that. We see that the future of mental health care, indeed all health care, is bringing power to the patient. It's in working with families, local communities, as true partners, not as passive recipients. It's about training professionals to put their knowledge into a new context and develop new skills to bring out an array of voices and perspectives and a sense of agency from day one. This, for me, this departure from the models of paternalism that have dominated for so long in public services will be a true mark of genuine transformation in the time ahead. It's really about mental health leading the way. I think also I'd say second issue, really proud that NELFT has established the first ever UK NHS training in open dialogue where uh, UK trainers join with international experts from four different countries and give clinicians a true grounding in how to move forward in a dialogical approach. Really important principles for us. And I think this is part of the kind of game-changing, cultural changing process that we're working through. And I think this is what is keeping us ahead of the curve. And this is what we want to drive into the future. I think the other thing that drives a real sense of proud is, pride is that we are driving and coordinating the, and leading the world's largest research project in open dialogue, deepening the evidence base further and hopefully proving its efficacy beyond doubt in an NHS context. But, Whilst we're waiting for that, there's so much more that we can already do. And one of the big moves is in a dialogical direction, as already recommended by NICE, for example, which is why we are proud to announce the UK's first service operating along the lines of some key open dialogue principles, accepting, of course, non-crisis referrals from anywhere in the country through primary care. It's called Dialogue First, and you'll be hearing more about that later on in the day. I think all that's left for me to say now is that you know, I look forward to hearing from many of you during the day. I think what's important in this kind of loop is the feedback and the learning that we experience, what we bring back to each other, how we learn and develop together. It's an enormously exciting future that we're facing. And today will be important in maintaining the energy. But finally, I would say, none of us would be here today. Little of the energy would have been generated were it not for the person that is the true architect of change in this country. In the model that will make the most difference in mental health in the time ahead, Russell Rosetta. Thank you, Russ. Thank you. Thank you, John. I can assure you I didn't write that last bit. <laughs> you did not. Yeah. Okay, so to tell you a little, I'm going to, I've got about six minutes, I'm going to try and rush through this and Val is looking at me because it's supposed to be keeping the time, but um, five minutes now. I'm going to finish all my time this way, just to be on the clock. Um, so I'm going to try and give you a bit of an introduction to Open Dialogue, a bit of an overview of what it is uh, and uh, how it works. 
and, uh, and also a bit of an introduction to our national open dialogue project in the NHS and what we've been doing to try and bring it about in our own services. So this slide is a fairly good kind of, uh, I think, summary of what open dialogue is really about, maybe apart from the word fix. But um, uh, essentially, when you really want to help somebody, you really want to enable someone to bloom, the best place to go is to their environment, rather than plucking them out of their environment and trying to make change there. And that's what Open Dialogue is really about. It's about working with the context, working with the family and the network and the people around uh, the individual, rather than the individual on their own. And of course, there's plenty of evidence that this actually works anyway. Uh, we know that people who have uh, uh, with friends and family and networks have better outcomes and study after study after study has shown how working with families produces better long-term outcomes, reduces relapse, um, uh, reduces uh, readmission to hospital uh, and in the long term costs less because people are, are less often uh, remaining in services. But our own services don't actually often work that way because we tend to have family therapy as an additional kind of side add-on. Uh, and we tend to have family and others involved as people from whom we take information or to whom we impart information. Actually involving people as collaborative members of the team uh, requires a very different kind of training and that's what Open Dialogue is all about. Now, the core principles of Open Dialogue are listed here and the further you go down the list, the more different it is to the way we deliver services uh, at the moment. So at the top in terms of provision of immediate help, you know, that kind of happens at the moment. People receiving support in crisis within 24, 48 hours, uh, being responsible for organising meetings at the beginning, that's also similar. But then we get to the social network perspective. Nobody is seen without their social network being primarily in mind. So who else is important to you? Who else is important in your life that you would like to bring along together uh, to see us? And we'll go into your environment and see uh, everybody who you consider a friend and family and part of your network. Uh, just under 50% of people in their uh, successive CQC surveys say that they don't actually get um, the people who they wanted to have in the room with them. Uh, with them. So who else can we bring along uh, and bring uh, as part of uh, the treatment and really making the partners? Psychological continuity is key. So the clinicians become part of that network. We're working to actually blend in with the network uh, rather than actually uh, uh, lead them, we're looking to, to, to join them. And therefore you can't have a chopping and changing one condition after the next, changing all the time. That's not going to be able to work. Uh, uh, therefore you need continuity of care all the way through. Dialogue and polyphony is the kind of therapeutic aspect of open dialogue. Well, what we're trying to do is actually learn, instead of clinicians jumping in there with answers, with solutions, with labels, uh, with declarations, being able to be mindful, because we teach mindfulness to all the clinicians on our training or, or similar uh, uh, activities, in order to be mindful with our own reactions, uh, so that we can observe them but not necessarily react to them, but enable therefore a space to be created for families and networks and the individual of concern to, to be able to talk uh, and start to use this space to bring up uh, things that have been unsaid potentially up till now. So it's really working with that, and therefore tolerance of uncertainty is key for clinicians. We need to be able to sit back rather than jumping to conclusions in order to allow that space to be created, in order for agency to be gained by the network, who can then take charge of the system and charge of their own treatment. This is what we mean when we talk about co-production. And that leads to a lot more flexible system, because whether it's medication or one-to-one -one therapy, people can start to decide for themselves what will work best for them. And that's what we're aiming for in this slide, basically tells you what we're looking to do. Rather than us be the ones coming in there, we give people space to sit alongside them while they find their own path. The outcomes in Finland, um, uh, many will know about, they haven't done any major randomised studies, but they have done naturalistic follows up for about 30 years, looking at what the outcomes have been. Uh, uh, and probably the biggest figure is the number of people who didn't relapse. So 74% after two years were back to work and study out of services, compared to about 9%, which is the average in most Western countries. That was as way off the scales compared to anywhere else. And a five year follow up, that figure rose to 86%. And talking to Yako a couple of weeks ago, he told me how actually they followed it up over a decade and that figure remains consistent. So a very big difference in terms of the number of people who become quote unquote chronic. The global take up as a result has been very substantial. A number of countries around the world have tried different versions. And in Germany, uh, for example, um, uh, Munich and Berlin, the commissioners will only commission open dialogue now because they've had such good outcomes. Um, and it, it isn't just in Finland where this has happened, uh, where perhaps part of the world where there are more reindeers than people. Um, it also occurs in inner city areas like New York, for example. So uh, when Obamacare came about, um, they uh, ended up 
uh, re diverting some of their funds, and they put a good deal of money into um, an open dialogue service called Parachute, $50 million, actually. It did so well that a couple of years later, they doubled that to $100 million. One thing we stole from them was the peer element, uh, uh, making sure that there are peer workers in every team uh, employed within the teams. Uh, and they're crucial in order for us to be able to work more dialogically, have less hierarchy, uh, respect and appreciate people's own lived experience. But also, they can help create a community of service users and peers and, and a wider network in the community that can work particularly with people who may be lacking in their own social network. <coughs> now, just to quickly skim through our NHS project, um, we've got five trusts who have been on our training. Um, so, you know, there's different trainings out there. One of the trainings that there's some leaflets been out for, there's a private sector training, um, which you'll have received some leaflets for, and which Nick will talk about later this afternoon. But the training we've organised in NELF is an NHS training uh, designed specifically for NHS staff to be able to attend. Uh, and we have people from five trusts who've attended this training that we organised. Um, it's delivered by 12 trainers from five different countries, including all of the international grandees and open dialogue. And we aim for the diploma to be accredited by the Association of Family Therapists. We had about 50 trainees went through last year, about 75 this year. And this is all part of a large randomised control trial study that we aim to launch next year. Uh, Professor Steve Pilling, who is the chief investigator and the lead for the study, and we have several uh, prestigious universities in London who have been putting together a £2.3 million grant application in which we will assess the areas where we're providing open dialogue against treatment as usual uh, in a randomised way over the next four or five years. And if you get a fraction of the outcomes they did in Finland, then we all expect this will be a significant game changer. Now, we are still welcoming people into our training. It's going to be a regular training with London South Bank University that Mark Hoffenbeck will talk about later. Um, and they can also engage in research evaluating different elements through, um, uh, through uh, nested studies, which is what they're called. So just to finish, there are, of course, challenges to bringing open dialogue in the NHS. At the moment, we have functional teams, teams that are divided by function, so an individual might go through different teams in their care pathway. And, of course, services are stretched due to finances. But, of course, the promise is that if open dialogue really works and delivers the kind of outcomes that we see, then hopefully we shouldn't have the vast number of numbers of people we do at the moment who've been in our system for 20, 30, 40 years. And in order, instead of having a long-term case study, we're putting a concentrated effort on people when they're really in crisis at the acute end of care. So it's about rearranging the way that we work. Workstream 1 in the research will be about trying to rearrange our services to deliver open dialogue uh, that way. That's Workstream 1. But um, we've also put out a questionnaire, which would be grateful if you could look at perhaps after the lunch break, once you've heard from people. Any thoughts and ideas you have about how we bring it about in the NHS? Obviously, we're doing work on it in the research. We're starting to think operationally in our trusts about how we create those open dialogue teams, those autonomous teams that can work this way in each of our areas, a different culture being brought about by working in this way. But any ideas you have in terms of overcoming these barriers, we can harness that creativity and help us create some change too. I'll just finish with this slide. The best way to predict the future, as it says, is to create it, and I'm a big believer in that. And I think that you'll see glimpses of that future today from service users, from families who have received open dialogue, uh, uh, and you'll hear their experience of it, you'll hear from clinicians who have been working this way, and I believe that that's something that we can genuinely aim for across the board in the NHS. I'm hoping that together it is something that we can create. Thanks very much. So I'm quite lucky today, I've got, I've got two people co-chairing with me, um, and I'll introduce our first co-chair, which is Val Jackson. Val, myself and Mark have been the three people who have been organising the training and, uh, and trying to coordinate a lot of this. Um, I met Val um, a couple of years ago now, and um, she, uh, she basically was uh, quite obviously a, a force of nature. Um, and has remained such ever since. She thinks she's retired, but they're not allowing her to retire. Um, and uh, yeah, she's been a stalwart force all the way through, and I'm quite convinced that she can be in several places at the same time. And you might notice that today, her sitting in the audience as well as last year. She managed to sit in the audience as well as be on stage somehow. And we'll see if she can repeat that this year. So uh, welcome and thanks for co-chairing this project. <laughs> We're running out of time, so welcome. We'll say hello in a minute. But we'll introduce our first speaker, which is Annie Jeffries. Annie has a powerful story to tell, a powerful message. We thought we'd start with her story because it's a bit of a wake-up call. It's a cautionary tale about how things have been up to now. 
she has her own experience as a carer in the NHS and as a result of that experience she's joined us in our training on the Open Dialogue training and been a fantastic member of our, of our team engaging our training and her story really does speak volumes to why we need to change. So it's with great pleasure that I welcome Annie Jeffrey. Hi, my name is Annie Jeffrey and I'm a member of the Kent team. My eldest son Tom came into contact with mental health services about seven years ago following a serious suicide attempt. When Tom became unwell, it felt as if our whole family was in crisis. It's now been almost two years since Tom ended his life, and I firmly believe that if we had been offered the peer-supported open dialogue approach, that he would still be here today, and that's why I wanted to join the pod training to improve the way mental health services are delivered in this country. When I found out about the open dialogue approach in Finland, I felt straight away that this way of working would help our family and many others. Many of the key principles are common sense, but are simply not happening in this country at the moment. One of the problems is people think that we're already doing this, but actually this isn't the experience for many people using services. Getting to people in crisis straight away is essential first meeting within 24 hours if required, and by offering immediate help, helps prevent people becoming even more unwell and may well prevent hospital admission. Despite the reduction in inpatient beds in England, the number of people being sectioned under the Mental Health Act is increasing. Community treatment orders also continue to increase, and a recent Oxford University study shows that they are not effective for the majority of people. The Mental Health Task Force states the challenges with system-wide implementation and increase in people using mental health services has led to inadequate provision and worsening outcomes in recent years, including an increase in the number of people taking their own lives. Suicide is now the leading cause of death for men under 50. Pressure on inpatient beds has been exacerbated by a lack of early intervention and crisis care, with people often transferred long distances outside of their areas. About one in five carers stop working due to the impact of trying to help loved ones. In a recent CQC review, only 14% of adults surveyed felt that they were provided with the right response in crisis. At present, services are set up for the convenience of services, not for the people using them, and this needs to change. You only need to speak to service users, carers and professionals to hear that current services are not working for many people. I constantly hear service users and carers saying they don't want to have to repeat their story over and over. People have told me they feel like a parcel, passed between different services, with no one taking overall responsibility. They don't feel listened to. Even within teams there is often no continuity, constantly different professionals. I also hear many mental health professionals state their frustration in not being able to work in the way they've been trained and want to work. I can't emphasise enough the importance of continuity of care. How many times do service users and carers have to request services with continuity before they're actually listened to? The open dialogue approach provides psychological continuity where a small st team stay with a person for however long they're needed. This is crucial in developing trust and openness and allowing dialogue. It's also interesting that this way of working reduces staff emotional burnout in countries using this approach. For Tom, my son, the constant change of staff made things much worse for him from um, to the point where he completely disengaged from services. In open dialogue, the family or social network is included right from the outside and this is beneficial for everyone. Many service users and carers have problems with confidentiality, but open dialogue prevents many of these arising in the first place by discussing things together right from the start. When someone becomes unwell, it often impacts on everybody else around them. Carers and service users often mention that they're asked to sit outside a meeting while they're discussed by mental health professionals, often people they have never met and who never appear at subsequent meetings. This has certainly happened to my family and I question how is this supposed to help anyone? 
With open dialogue, everything is said during the meetings in front of the network and by listening to professionals reflecting at intervals between themselves is so helpful. It starts to allow space for the network to start to use their own resources to resolve issues. Many families have mentioned that they have tried to talk about issues and problems on their own, but the conversation gets shut down. There is something very special that happens within the network meetings where people feel listened to and taken seriously that allows them to start to talk about issues that may be contributing to problems, often talking about things for the first time in years. My experience of working this way is so different to the current model of care. By including siblings, grandparents, families or friends, whoever is important to that person means that all the voices are heard and by carrying this out at a place which is best for the person and their social network reduces stigma and anxiety. The open dialogue approach recognises that every crisis point is an opportunity to rebuild fragmented networks. Interestingly, in this country at the moment, we're often told that people are too ill to benefit from psychological discussion when they are in crisis. Mm -hmm. However, my experience and that of many others is exactly the opposite. This was the only time when a small window of opportunity appeared, when my son Tom would find, could find words to talk about his trauma. The outcomes from the open dialogue in Finland are amazing compared with those in the UK at present. Less people relapsing, use of less medication, reducing stigma, people seeking help earlier. The best part of the training for me is seeing people, families benefiting from working in this way. The five year forward view in mental health states the critical element of success will be to put the individual with their own lived experience of mental health at the heart of each and every decision which is made and the need to produce services which are led by the needs of the individual, not the system. This is exactly what the open dialogue approach is all about. I believe we have a real opportunity to change mental health services for the better, to provide real parity of esteem with physical health, to make a real difference. Thank you. been an inspiration and when I think that Annie came on our first cohort of training and almost we felt it wasn't long after she lost her son and we thought is she, is she going to be able to manage this and we nearly said no to her and I, it, it was so amazing to have her as part of our training and I have no regrets. Thank you. I want to thank Russell, who's been my inspiration. He's visionary, and he's so full of humility, and he's a joy to work with. So thank you. So, I want to move on now. Uh, now we have a, a family who I met very recently, who very bravely agreed to be uh, uh, worked on, I suppose, what's the word? <laughs> Um, anyway, they came on our training program, so uh, with a very large audience. And so I'd like to introduce to you um, the Lee family, Chris and Kirsty. for having us here today. I feel very fortunate to be talking about our experiences of open dialogue. Um, we feel very grateful we've actually had the opportunity to experience open dialogue because we feel that it's an approach that, um, as a family, it's assisted us out of the crisis that we were in. Uh, the crisis was where we found ourselves last November. It was Friday the 13th, to be exact. And I, um, along with my mum and my dad, stood on the outside of um, a crisis that my brother was in. Um, never quite experienced a crisis before and I didn't quite appreciate how, um, how quickly the balance can be tipped between everything being okay to everything just falling apart. 
I also didn't quite realise the importance for the need for someone to take the situation and try and fix it. As a sister and a daughter, this is my mum, everyone, um, I, I sort of, these crisis like issues are something that I'd usually pass to my family. My mum and my dad, they'd usually solve the problems that me and my brother had together. Uh, but unfortunately, this was something really different. None of us knew how to cope, and we no none of us knew where to turn. Oops, sorry. Uh, in the first 24 hours, I think I made phone calls to every charity I could think of in the town and the area that we live in, which is in Kent. Can you help? Is there anybody out there that can help us? That was the question that we kept asking. Uh, in denial and without physical injury, we didn't feel that we could burden 999. There was no accident, but my brother's increase in frustration and anxiety and his frenzy, which we thought we could cope with, began to feel like a real emergency. For the sake of checking his physical health, my brother was taken to A&E and came home with a healthy report, which was a huge relief. He was assigned then to the crisis team. Although we had this confirmation that he'd returned in a healthy state, there were no drugs in his system, he returned with the same pace and the same peaks and troughs of aggression and a regressive like child behaviour, which was really hard to see and out of character for my brother who I'd looked up to for so many years. And it was really quite very, very frightening actually for, for all of the family. Um, with the crisis team on hand, we felt we were finally being seen to. The crisis team did their utmost to reassure Brett and they did a really, really good job. We, we couldn't fault them at all. However, unfortunately, the valued half an hour that we'd have from the crisis team came from different people. We never saw the same person twice. We, we may have done once <coughs> or twice. And we felt that we were spending a lot of time explaining the same story to different people. And the unfamiliar faces to my brother were strangers, and they seemed to increase his paranoia and anxiety, which didn't ever help solve the problem. We appreciate the demands and the tight schedules that the crisis team are under, and in the very thick of it, I think we probably needed a little bit more from them than they could give us. We probably expected too much from them, but at the time they were our only refuge and we'd navigate our whole day around the waiting for their visit, and we'd spend a lot of time pacifying my brother, like, the crisis team are coming, they'll be here soon, like, let's not pack all our bags up in tinfoil and, and, and fly to Australia. Um, the crisis team, they had to make assessments on my brother, who, during the time that we were in, he was a completely unreliable narrator. He was so difficult to obsess, uh, to, to assess, sorry, and he was obsessively writing for 12 hours of the day in search for this new identity. So it was really difficult to try and assess, we, we felt it was really difficult for the crisis team to try and assess him when he wasn't really talking any sense to anybody. Um, the crisis team showed us great empathy throughout the whole experience and understood it had become too much and after a week of sleepless night shifts, tears, arguments, denial, togetherness and long drawn out days, Brett was admitted to St Martin's in Canterbury where we live in Kent. He spent 12 days there and that was where we were fortunate enough to meet Yasmin and this is where the open, op open dialogue opportunity opened. Our first meeting was held in the hospital. It was a really small room, and apart from the odd pictures on the wall, it was a relatively sterile environment, as most hospitals are. But we all sat there together, and the room filled with the most overwhelming amount of energy. And it's still quite emotional today. <laughs> um, although I'm sure Yasmin, Paul and Lisa, our clinicians, had some structure to their conversation, we didn't once feel that there was an agenda. There was no interrogation, there was no judgement, and there was, there was no presence of a white coat taking notes all the time. And each, each of the clinicians, Lisa, Paul and Yasmin, they each listened and absorbed the energy, and they would just take short moments to offer clarification, like questions, to be sure no one's voice was lost in the conversation. I can't explain quite why, but it felt like we'd entered this neutral room where anything could be said, and coming from a family that had separated years ago, it was something that we'd never quite experienced before. Um, not only were we be able to sort of talk, not, we were not only able to talk in these sessions, but each one of us also learned to listen. And we could take a new perspective and listen to my brother instead of interrogating him and keep questioning what's wrong with you. With that, we were able to. Um, to, to cut to sort of take new perspectives from each of the um, each of the, the the sessions that we had, um, the meeting made us feel safe and secure, 
and we felt confident that Brett could come home to the family home, as opposed to where we felt so frightened before. The movie team felt like a breakthrough, and with an overwhelming sense of relief, we felt that relief left us with, as we left the room. We were able to come to terms with my brother's crisis, and since then, we've had further open dialogue meetings back at home, and Brett's been able to see the same faces and gain, an, a and, and gain collective and individual support from his key workers, who are the same every time. This enabled Brett to accept his crisis, and now, as we speak, he's actually back at work, which is really good progress. And day by day, he's moving forward, accepting that he was unwell, but he's getting better. We feel that we've got Brett back, and another 50% at least. He's more communicative than ever. An open dialogue allowed our family and Brett's support network to pull together instead of pulling each other apart. I know it's different in every situation, but I hope open dialogue can be pushed to the forefront of a crisis. In the point that, in the first critical 24 hours, when you feel that there's nowhere to turn, I hope no one has to experience the feelings of fear we had in that period. If I could give one word for open dialogue, the one word to those who are suffering mental health, to those families facing feelings of blame and worry and fear for their loved ones, then the word would be hope. There is hope in open dialogue because open dialogue gave us hope. Thank you. Thank you so much, Trish and Kirsty, for sharing that. And Katie, can we have boxes of tissues uh, around? Because <laughs> I brought mine. And I think I might need them a few times today. That was, yeah, really moving. Thank you. So now we move on to Trish uh, Willett. Trish wants to move over this way. She's the clinical lead occupational therapist with the community recovery team in Waltham Forest, which is part of NELFT, and she's currently a student on our current training course. Welcome, Trish. Okay, um, so as Val's already mentioned, I'm an occupational therapist, currently on the training, and uh, as an OT, I'm inherently interested or maybe because I'm a bit of a nerd, I'm obsessive about occupational roles, the way we fulfil them, why we adopt them, what's in the story, what's in the narrative, and what makes us fulfil our roles to our full potential and to our own full satisfaction. But as well as my role as an OT, I have been a service user, I've been a client, as it were, um, a patient and uh, I find the word patient quite funny because when I was a patient I was not patient at all <laughs> yeah. I was looking for an answer and I beat myself up and services inadvertently used to give me a few sticks to help me out um, by changing appointments changing times changing workers here and there um, but it wasn't intentional and um, like my nurse, psychiatric, OT, psychology colleagues, we worked with the tools that we had on the day. Uh, but now there's some additional tools. Some might say we've got a brand new toolkit in peer open dialogue. Happy days. Um, a way that appears to remember is my understanding of open dialogue, not only that the clients are human, but also that those, the, those clinicians, people that are paid to be in their lives are human too. And they're not simply there to treat or solve or listen to the problems, but trying to connect somehow, truly listen, and figure out a path alongside someone, <coughs> not always knowing about the length of the path or the best way for us, but to try and carve it out and it's just a more graceful 
way to be with patients, to be with clients. Um, to talk about my experience as a pod trainee, uh, as a slightly introverted city kid, putting me in anywhere that's near grass, out in the country, with a room full of people, it's like, uh, but I actually do like it, I've actually I've enjoyed it. And um, the biggest change for me in my practice now is that I just feel more present with the people that I'm working with. And uh, I know that makes sound a little bit ethereal, and I just sort of just want a sort of disclaimer to say that open peer open dialogue isn't some sort of mental health magic fairy dust. You, you don't need to be sitting in a cave reciting Kate Bush lyrics. It is quite a normal um, way of being and a way of connecting with people. So I was asked to make this talk as uh, unique as possible, and my other role that people might not know about me is sometimes I write poetry. It's not gonna be Thomas Hardy or Ezra Found, I'm afraid, it's going to be a bit bad. But I just want to capture the spirit, I'm just warning you, uh, I just wanna capture the spirit of um, open dialogue in a poem. So some of this is a little bit tongue in cheek and uh, I just wanna say I am not the voice of pod. So if I, if I offend any of the other uh, clinicians or anybody else involved in the training, please forgive me. So it's called the, the Space Between. The space between our, our words is where your voice is heard. When silent, when raised, we have not arrived to fix to solve or to erase, if let us in to learn. There's a knock at the door. You can hang your coat there, and while you're at it, please drop your clinical gaze by the shoes. <laughs> Take a breath. So who would like to start? Be in a moment, and if suffering is there, contain, remain still. The voices are equal, valuable and valid. We sense, not all of it is senseless. So we turn to each other. I wonder if he feels this. Does she know the pain felt in the quiet when she is not hearing and then we turn back we tune in to the now so what do you think on hearing what we just said a breath a sigh cracks the room the art of conversation flows it hits rocks and navigates brooks, but ultimately gets to the sea. And a piece of light comes in. Open dialogue creates a space for the practitioner to be still and present with thoughts and feelings. It's in the hope that the people we connect with, the people we serve, can find more stillness and can find more presence within. We are all the hope, the energy that fills a room when we enter it. Thank you very much. That, that was wonderful, Trish. So, to hear your voice like that, that was uh, just remarkable. Thank you. 
So now we move to Heather, Heather Jace, who's a registered mental health nurse, and she's also a student on our current <coughs> training course. So, and you're working in Kent. <laughs> she's working in Kent, yes. Thank you, Heather. admission ward in Canterbury and I had my first experience of peer supported open dialogue at the end of last year when I went to a conference in Ashford run by KMP team. I went into the conference open and quite frankly unprepared for what I was to witness. I sat and I listened to the speakers and a live network meeting and I watched in wonder and disbelief that there was an approach to mental illness and distress that was so connected. It was during this conference that I had my first experience of a fishbowl. I will explain. A fishbowl is a circle of people who sit and talk about their thoughts and feelings with a wider circle outside listening. And people can move within the circles and they sit and they listen. And as I spoke about what I thought of the things that I had heard that day, I knew I couldn't be wrong because no one was inside my head. These were my feelings. And people were listening to me and I felt really heard. Now just this simple task had a real impression on me and I knew that this was the right way forward. I started my training at the beginning of this year and that was at the end of January. And I sat in a barn with 75 other people and in my head I thought, oh well, at least we're not going to have the usual introductions that you get at these courses. How wrong I was. <laughs> Two hours of names and little ditties of people's lives kicked the whole journey off. And as that microphone moved closer and closer to me, a mantra popped into my head. If you're not living life on the edge, you're taking up too much space. <laughs> so I decided to embrace the lot. And it's that little mantra that's had me standing up in front of you today. During an exercise on that first week, I sat and I spoke about an experience I was having on that day about my eldest son, Ethan. He was taking his first GCSE on that day. I had a pod team listening to me as I spoke. I talked about my guilt about not being there, all those kinds of things. And not once did they interrupt me as I was speaking. They listened intently. When I'd finished, they spoke between themselves about what I'd said, echoing the words that I had used. <clears throat> they didn't try and solve things or try and make me feel better about the decisions that I had made. They just echoed the things that I had said. And it felt incredible. Now the next exercise was a role play, the dreaded role play. And I decided this time I needed to be the therapist. I had to try this for myself. So as I sat there, I thought, just listen. Just listen to what's going on. My role play family laid out the most emotional, distressing situation that would put the cast of EastEnders to shame. To be honest. <laughs> I leant in and started trying to resolve things for them, to try and alleviate their, their pain. I was stopped in my tracks. <clears throat> right, just listen, I thought, listen. They started again. And I must have sat back and glazed over because I was stopped again and asked to be more engaged. <laughs> Damn it, I thought, this is really hard. <laughs> so it was that evening that I was phoning home and I spoke to my other son, Hayden. Now he's nine years old and he's quite a switched on wee chap. And he said to me, okay mum, so what have you learnt today? And I said, oh, right, okay. I've learnt how to be with people how to listen to their words and allow their feelings to come out. He said, well, that's easy. You do that all the time anyway. So, mm, okay, well, the weird thing is, actually, I don't, and though it sounds really simple, it's actually really hard. Now, there's elements of open dialogue that I do bring to my nursing role already. I have quite a patient orientated style, I've been told. But what I am learning is to allow space and time for emotions to be heard and expressed. 
by everyone, so everyone has a voice. Has a voice. This connection can create an honesty and trust between people. I have a question in my head. How has the mental health service moved so far <coughs> away from the people that it serves? It feels as though it's been overcomplicated by assessments and judgments and copious amounts of paperwork that involve very little of the person at the centre of it all. I'd like you to think upon these things. Firstly, the power of connecting with someone else. Letting someone express themselves in their own way, in their own words, with no more jargon. Distressed people having their relations, their relations around them, their friends and family, to speak to each other as they normally would. Families can often solve their own problems and make their own plans. This is much stronger and sustainable than our resolutions. And lastly, an equal standing. How are we ever going to be experts in other people's lives and relationships and experiences? <coughs> now this has been a steep learning curve, but I'm excited and I'm ready to push on. And I don't know where this path is going to take me and who I'll meet along the way, but I'm happy to sit with the uncertainty. I'm due to start working with a family in the next month, and I'm excited. And I do believe that this will be the real start of open dialogue for me. Thank you very much. Thank you, Heather. That really helped me reconnect with why we're doing this. I think actually hearing from Heather's perspective. Um, and yeah. That was really, truly inspirational. So now we move on to Nina. Nina Goff Cooper, she's a, has, is using services currently, yeah. Um, I just think it's so courageous for, for her to come and speak to us today. Thank you, Nina. talk about my experience of mental health services from having personally received both treatment as usual and peer supported open dialogue approaches and also from the perspective of being a clinician and working in the NHS. First of all I'd like to tell you a little bit about my background. I received a diagnosis of bipolar disorder in 2002 at the age of 25 and since then I estimate that I've spent about 40% of the time feeling depressed or manic and about 60% of the time feeling normal in mood and able to, con to function in life. I've experienced seven manic episodes and been treated at four different hospitals. Admissions ranging in length from two to six weeks and five of those admissions being under sections of the Mental Health Act. <coughs> the most recent admission Re most recent episode was in September 2014, resulting in a hospital admission and followed by a five month recovery period. The style of treatment I've experienced has changed immensely over the past 14 years, with earlier experiences being characterised by coercive medical interventions and compulsory medication. Even when being a voluntary patient or being treated in the community, I felt little autonomy in my choices of medication and treatment and have been on a number of medications, mood stabilizers and antipsychotics and antidepressants over the years. A process of trial and error in order to try and stabilize my mood, but dictated by the doctors with no choice being given to me as a service user. <coughs> I'm by no means resentful or ungrateful for those earlier interventions, as I know that in several cases my life was literally saved, as in my states of illness I was highly vulnerable and put myself into some dangerous situations. However, when I reflect upon my journey, I wish that Open Dialogue had been available to me earlier, as I feel many years of my life were lost due to this illness. And since being treated with the Open Dialogue approach, I've regained my health, confidence and self-esteem in a way that I'd only dreamed and prayed would happen for many years. I've received many forms of therapy over the years, 
both within the NHS and paid for privately, <coughs> including CBT, CAT, art therapy, <coughs> dance movement therapy, music therapy, counselling, and even Jungian analysis. <coughs> All of these therapies helped me learn more about myself and how to manage my condition, but it was not until I started to be a part of open dialogue with my family, friends and clinicians have I felt true deep healing as the weight of years of repressed emotions have been expressed and released and my, re my relationships with those closest who support me have grown closer and deeper as mutual understanding has been facilitated. Since starting to work with the Open Dialogue team in January of last year, three months after the peak of my last crisis, my mental health has steadily improved and most importantly for me, my relationships with my family, in particular my husband, my mother and my brother, have grown as we've been able to talk about how my illness has impacted not only me but them too. They've been able to give voice to their pain and fears that have arisen due to me being unwell, which has then been healing for the whole family. We've been able to sit down and discuss our deepest feelings in such a way that would never have been possible without the presence of the clinicians and their professionalism and skills of listening, empathy and ability to reflect back to us what they hear. This empathy and reflecting is incred incredibly validating for an individual. Actually being heard in an egalitarian relationship, I, thou, rather than doctor patient, has been instrumental in building my belief in myself as a person with a mental health challenge, yes, but also with the capacity to make choices for myself and deserving of the respect of those with a duty of care to look after my best interests. I feel truly blessed to have had the opportunity to, to experience the open dialogue approach to treatment and the effects of my deep recovery have also made a tremendous impact in my professional life. After many years of not working due to ill health, I returned full time to the workforce four years ago and I knew that with my lived experience of mental illness, I would be well placed to support others going through similar difficulties. In 2013, I started working for NELFT in the Barking and Dagenham Improving Access to Psychological Therapy Service as a psychological wellbeing practitioner. I work with people experiencing depression and anxiety disorders and the emotional journey I have been on throughout my time with Open Dialogue has, I feel, made me a better practitioner. I'm able to deeply empathise with my patients and my skills in delivering CBT interventions are informed by my own experiences as I know exactly what depression feels like. and how debilitating an illness it can be. My performance in my job is also strengthened by the continual support I have received from the Open Dialogue team, as our meetings have given me the chance to talk with them as professional peers, and they have understood some of the challenges I face, as we all face working in the NHS. I would say that the hidden blessing in suffering a severe and enduring mental illness is in being able to help others who are still suffering and it's very satisfying to see people get better and know that I'm doing a good job to help them in their process. In conclusion, I'm undoubtedly a massive fan and proponent of peer-supported open dialogue and I hope that the funding and support is available to continue the research and rolling out of services to more people who need it. I also wish to publicly thank my team for their support over the past 15 months. Bev, Yasmin, Lauren, Russell and Lucy. I'm very thankful to you all for helping my family and I to transform our relations with one another and for helping me to recover. Thank you. Wow, thank you so much. And during that, I mean, a lot of our responses when we're working in this way is to be aware of what's happening in your body. And I certainly felt that to hear Nina talk in that way. Um, and thank you so much. I feel so privileged to be able to hear these stories.